Now we are moving to the last presentation of this symposium. That's a practical approach to sudden cardiac death by Dr. Susita Amarasinghe, a consultant uh, cardiac electrophysiologist from the teaching hospital Karavitir. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, President. And I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association Organizing Committee for taking the challenge and uh, organizing this conference in a virtual format. Uh, as well as I would like to congratulate the online audience who's uh, staying connected for the whole day. Uh, moving to the talk, uh, after two comprehensive uh, discussions on acute coronary syndrome related uh, uh, presentations, uh, let us talk about sudden cardiac death, a practical approach to the management and prevention. And uh, it's important to understand it is not the same as acute coronary syndrome, though there is a significant overlap. So, a sudden cardiac death, though we don't consider it as common, it's not uncommon. It's actually, uh, it's the cause for most of the cardiovascular deaths, as well as it is only second to uh, all cause mortality of all cancers combined worldwide. And uh, there are a few terms and definitions that we need to be familiar with when we are trying to understand about sudden cardiac arrest and death. Sudden cessation of the cardiac activity leading to circulatory collapse is called sudden cardiac arrest, where the patient may recover subsequently. And sudden cardiac death is when the patient uh, dies during within an hour of onset of symptoms. And abortion sudden cardiac arrest is when the patient survives the cardiac arrest event. And we know sudden infant death syndrome is also quite similar, where the, uh, the unfortunately the, uh, the infant dies within the first six months of life. Sad or sudden arrhythmia death is also the same. So epidemiology, a few words. Uh, SCD or sudden cardiac death accounts for 15% of all deaths and 50% of cardiac deaths as we discussed. And the incidence, overall incidence in the population is about 1 to 2%. However, in high risk population as well as as the age advances, the incidence goes up exponentially. And we know time to time we see this in public domain in the media and quite striking uh, news about uh, young or otherwise very healthy people dying. In fact, we, individuals, some, some are much healthier than most of us, just dying suddenly, spontaneously, which is very devastating. And it's not only in the international arena, it's even in the, the our local setup, we do see these and quite unfortunate. How do we approach or how do we manage the golden principle is effective CPR and uh, what is called sudden cardiac arrest related chain of survival, which denotes early access to effective CPR, early CPR, early defibrillation, early advanced care and definitive management. These things need to be uh, very familiar uh, concepts for every doctor these days. And this graph is a very valuable graph to de depict that the time takes for resuscitation or onset of resuscitation and how it affects the survival subsequently. You can understand every minute goes past without a CPR, the chance of survival for the victim goes down by 10%. And this is also confirmed in multiple international studies where if now the uh, the concept is to introduce early defibrillation in the community level and this has increased the survival of these patients who suddenly develop sudden cardiac arrest and defibrillation we all should be familiar and there are three modalities the manual defibrillator that we all have we all see in the uh, hospital setup and the community setup based uh, automated external defibrillators which can even guide a lay person to extend to uh, carry out a defibrillation in case of a cardiac arrest. And of course, as a definitive management, what we implant is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So all three have the same purpose of terminating a malignant ventricular arrhythmia. So before we go into in detail, let us see few case scenarios. All of these cases are cases that presented to either to teaching hospital Karapiti or the regional hospitals in Southern province. And uh, you can see how devastating and how striking these presentations are. A 49-year-old male, uh, executive of a private company, who 
who had his shift diabetes, which he was not taking regular medications for, or was having high BMI, uh, being treated for GORD mostly by himself, and occasional episodes of chest discomfort. And he was found collapsed at the office, and after an, another episode of heavy gastric pain, there was unfortunately no bystander CPR and brought to the ETU in electromechanical dissociation. The rhythm was electromechanical dissociation with fixed dilated pupils. The subsequent postmortem revealed a LAD territory infarction. So you can see what we have been discussing all this time, how significant is acute coronary syndrome and sometimes the patient doesn't survive the event to reach a hospital alive. And that's why the management of acute coronary syndrome is so important and awareness is so important and most importantly prevention is or early detection and management of coronary heart disease before it goes into developed acute coronary syndrome is the most important. Uh, case 2, a 32 year old male, a military personnel without any significant previous history who has had a recent febrile illness with a respiratory tract infection and was also recovering from same. He had a good lunch, uh, maybe because he was recovering from the illness and went for sleep after the lunch in the afternoon, only to be found by found dead at around 4 p.m. by his own mother, which was a devastating incident. And uh, the, he was one of two boys in the family. Uh, the mother never recovered from the, the loss and the bereavement. And uh, this shows how dramatic and how devastating what is the entity of sudden cardiac death. Uh, his ECGs, he has had a couple of ECG done before for annual medical checkups that was done for military, uh, military recruitment as well as for continuation of military service, which was uh, found to have non-specific easy changes according to the records uh, to be eventually found to be Brugada related. Uh, the, the Brugada syndrome, I'm sure most of you are familiar, we will discuss about it. And in Sri Lanka, it's not uncommon to have this scenario. Third case is a 17-year-old 70 70 male, previously well, involved in many sports at, at school. Uh, he was nearing uh, sc uh, school leaving age and only symptom he has had previously was occasional mild fainting. So pre-syncope, never had a syncopal episode or collapse. He uh, participated in a marathon where he collapsed. And unfortunately, again, there was no systematic CPR given at, at the site. And uh, he was presented to ETU in a local hospital in VF, despite uh, an extensive uh, effort with resuscitation, patient didn't recover and postmortem revealed a hypertrophic heart, which is uh, actually the diagnosis is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the fourth case is a 69 year old male, a previously diagnosed STEMI patient, a patient who has had a ST elevation myocardial infarction five years ago, who has been on regular medication and monthly clinical follow-up, wh whose ejection fraction was 35, and the ECGs showed ventricular ectopics. And he has had several episodes of pre-syncope and syncope. And uh, he has been generally reassured that these are mild symptoms and post mostly posture related. However, he was found dead during sleep in one of the nights. And uh, remember, just because a patient had, was on regular medications and monthly clinical follow-up, that doesn't really mean that he was always uh, assured of safety. He may not have been compliant, he may not have been on the ideal med medication management, or he may, the clinic management, there may have been things that needed to be addressed. So we'll discuss this in detail in a little while. So how do we identify those P patients who are at risk of developing this uh, devastating event? So there's no one way. And it's very challenging because we are talking about a whole population with various subcategories of groups involved in various risks. So, however, symptoms or physical symptoms and signs are always helpful and is again the basis of uh, uh, clinical decision making to decide on uh, down which line we are going to investigate them. Some Critical symptoms that you should analyze are shortness of breath or chest pain that limits exercise or unexplained disease spells or blackouts, especially on exertion, prolonged palpitations. All these are, should be eye openers. And family history is very important. If there's a first degree letter with a history of ca cardiac death, it's going to be really important as well as extended family history. And anyway, uh, anybody in the family with any suspicious symptoms as well. And screening is not really easy, very challenging, 
because we don't know where to draw the line. We can't be screening every, each and every child in the schools or everybody who, who participate in uh, uh, strenuous exercises. However, we need to consider this. So we, if you analyze the causes of sudden cardiac death, coronary artery disease, of course, is by far the commonest cause. And as we mentioned, up to 50% of deaths related to the coronary artery death happens as sudden cardiac deaths. And in addition, the cardiomyopathies, which may be dilated cardiomyopathy, secondary any form of etiology or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. These are def definite entities that you all people out of whom you are interested can uh, study these and uh, there are ways of identifying these on these ages. And inherited arrhythmia syndromes, pellular heart disease as well as other causes that are not directly cardiac such as metabolic drugs and uh, substances can be causes for sudden cardiac death. If you look at the underlying arrhythmia mechanism that leads to sudden cardiac arrest, by far the biggest factor is the ventricular tachyarrhythmias, which subsequently degenerate into ventricular fibrillation, or they are sent called primary ventricular fibrillation, or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, and advanced bradycardias. Advanced decrease of heart blocks can also be the reason. So identify high risk populations, so we need to be aware that certain high risk categories like a patient who has had a cardiac myocardial infarction within last six weeks or who has had the LV scar following MI, even if it is a long term one, and who's having a residual LV dysfunction, as well as the patients that we discuss underlying cardiomyopathy or inherited ch acquired channel effects. And it's important to understand it's not a fa one factor generally that uh, leads to sudden cardiac death, it's an interplay of multiple factors. The more the factors, the higher the risk. And the substrate is one main category where such a factors such as coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies, or underlying channel pathies, all these can be playing a uh, major role. And the triggering event is the other important thing, which can be metabolic, drugs, electrolytes, trans, uh, neuro or endocrine, such a, like that. And the underlying mechanism, if there's any re-entry already happening inside the myocardium or automaticity, triggered activity, all this will facilitate a malignant ventricular arrhythmia. One factor is enough to cause a ventricular arrhythmia, however, combination will increase the chances of developing sudden cardiac arrhythmia. This is how it happens. So if you have to talk about tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias, which are at high risk, but one thing we need to know is, so this is somewhat basic, every doctor generally will understand, advanced decrease of tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias are significant. Also, we need to understand interpreting an arrhythmia and the significance of the arrhythmia in the context of, context of how fatal the arrhythmia can be. We need to not only look at the ECG appearance of the tachyarrhythmia, we need to look at the whole patient, understand whether the patient is a physiologically normal patient or a patient with a physiological uh, limitation of the physiological reserve. Someone who already has a compromised heart or compromised uh, lungs or pulmonary capacity will be tolerating uh, arrhythmia poorly than a person with a normal reserve. So uh, whether they are going to develop a sudden cardiac death or not is not only based on the arrhythmia itself, also their capability of tolerating the arrhythmia. When we talk about the sudden cardiac death, we generally talk about the sudden uh, cardiac death related arrhythmia of occurring in a structural normal heart, structurally abnormal heart, and also due to non-cardiac causes. So we discuss some of it, and the primary electrical disease of the heart, inherited or acquired, is dramatic in the sense that whatever the investigation that generally we do will become normal. So the echocardiogram uh, can be normal. ECG generally will show some abnormalities if you look at it carefully and the metabolic drugs and transient or reversible causes can also be contributing to sudden cardiac death in, uh, in the context of non-cardiac causes. So it's important to differentiate between the true sudden cardiac death versus myocardial infarction. We are, being doctors, we are aware of the classical symptoms of myocardial infarction. Sudden cardiac arrest is somewhat uh, different where the patient's primary symptom could be uh, palpitations or pre syncope followed by loss of consciousness. So we have discussed enough about coronary artery diseases and uh, how, how it can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. And you can see uh, what we see on the ECG or echocardiogram, what we see in the reality uh, in the histology is quite correlating and we see a complete 
explosion of major blood vessels when people present with devastating event of sudden cardiac death. And left ventricular dysfunction is the other important factor uh, that predicts the risk of sudden cardiac death. We sometimes don't realize that uh, our assumption is that left ventricular dysfunction leads to shortness of breath and multiple symptoms. In the same time, it leads to a risk of ventricular arrhythmias as well. Itself, it's not 100% accurate, but it gives you uh, the opportunity to uh, identify people who are at a higher risk so that you can arrange more assessment or keep a closer eye on them so that these people will not be lost for follow up and to see how risky they are in the long term and how to avoid, uh, how to save them from dying due to a sudden cardiac arrest. And this graph demonstrates how very well the f combination of factors like ejection, low ejection fraction and presence of ventricular ectopics or ventricular arrhythmias on ESGs or 24 halters, how it increases the chances of them developing fatal arrhythmias. And there's enough and more evidence suggesting that underlying uh, cardiac status, including fraction, can be directly correlating with uh, risk of sudden cardiac death. And apart from the coronary diseases related to sudden cardiac death, these are the commonest causes that, uh, or the most striking causes that lead to sudden cardiac death, which include some of the uh, case scenarios that we discussed at the beginning. So, few ECGs. Uh, this is a classic ECG of a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you can see very characteristically features of left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, when you do an echocardiogram, that will sh show thickened, characteristically thickened myocardium in the left ventricle, which is actually the substrate for arrhythmias. And again, another ECG that can go unnoticed if you don't have a look, uh, closer look on these people and if you talk to them you will know that they are generally having classical symptoms of palpitations or uh, pre-syncopy or syncopy. So this is a patient This is a patient whom we took to the e EP lab where we induced the tachyarrhythmia based on his symptoms and identified that he had a electrical connection connecting the atrium to the ventricle. If you look at the top line, you see that the patient has a pre-excitation on the ECG, which disappears during radio frequency ablation. So the message is that some of these are curable and patient can live a normal life thereafter and without having having any risk of sudden cardiac death. So another uh, classic ECG of a patient who present with a cardiac arrest is the, when you look at the ECG, if you're familiar, you will know that the V1, V2 leads does, doesn't look normal up to V3. And it, it's very characteristically in lead V1, you see the uh, hump towards the uh, end of the QRS complex, which is called epsilon wave. So this is the histology where the right ventricle is grossly abnormal. And in fact, these people, when they, when they develop the advanced disease, go on to develop vent left ventricular abnormalities as well. Generally, they, their life expectancy is normal, not normal, unless we intervene and uh, manage the risk of sudden cardiac death. And this is the other classical ECG that we very often see in Sri Lanka. This is, uh, we are in a hot spot for this particular abnormality, which is called Brugada syndrome, which is secondary to sodium channelopathy of the cardiac myocytes. And identifying it is easy when it present in this way, in V1, lead V1, V2, V3, you see strikingly abnormal down sloping ST elevations, which amounts to type 1 Brugada pattern. However, there are occasional, there are other two ty types which sometimes can be difficult to diagnose, which are type 2 and 3. What is more challenging is that these patterns can be interchanging between each other depending on the, the factors. And uh, it's always better to have a high degree of suspicion to make sure that these people are not missed. This is what it causes. It causes a ventricular fibrillation generally in the night or after a uh, triggering event. And another classic condition is long QT syndrome where there are various types of different subtypes even uh, which leads to a QT prolongation which uh, is which predisposes patients to develop polymorphic ventricular tachycardia so one such patient whom we had who went into develop multiple polymorphic ventricular arrhythmias eventually requiring implantation of a device so there are more than 13 to 14 subtypes However, on this EG, if you see carefully, they all will present with acuity prolongation, sometimes very difficult to diagnose unless you have a high degree of suspicion. In the same way, the relatively new diagnosis is short QT syndrome, another 
malignant condition patients unless manage they properly they will not survive to adulthood they present with acute interval generally less than 350 milliseconds and with tachyarrhythmias either atrial or ventricular and the fatal event will be due to uh, ventricular arrhythmia so another not so uncommon however not common uh, category is what is called catecholaminergic polymorphic vd generally they are well during uh, rest and the moment they go on to develop uh, strenuous exercise they develop this what is called by uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or bidirectional ventricular tachyarrhythmia with multiple morphologies of ventricular tachycardia at least of two varieties and they go into develop vf subsequently so idiopathic ventricular fibrillation is also uh, uh, another entity that leads to sudden cardiac death which encompasses uh, early reperfusion syndrome to extent as well as jwf syndrome and somewhat poorly defined entity at the moment however people who have structural normal heart completely normal ecgs who suddenly develop ventricular fibrillation some of them have this entity and the people who survive a sudden cardiac arrest are known to have a very high risk of a second arrest so just because someone re- re- survive a event doesn't mean that they are going to be okay afterwards actually they are going to have higher risk of another event that means they will need definitive management in the form of medications as well as device therapy so depending on uh, the presentation following a sudden cardiac arrest uh, following a resuscitation of a sudden cardiac arrest Uh, depending if we are sure about the arrhythmia that the patient presented with then the investigation will be based on that if you are not sure about the presentation and the arrhythmia then it will involve an extensive work up to identify what was the primary arrhythmia that led to the cardiac arrest however if there is no identifiable cause then you also need to think about reversible causes substance abuse or other non cardiac causes as well can it be prevented it's very challenging but it can if we if we take the right steps we can to a large extent and ideally it should be done before a patient develop a cardiac arrest obviously or at least after when they recover when they survive a event there are two concepts which are called primary prevention and secondary prevention primary prevention is when uh, before they develop a cardiac arrest and secondary prevention is people who have had a cardiac arrest who survived who need a secondary prevention of a second cardiac arrest which involves lifestyle modifications and identifying and managing their primary arrhythmia condition as well as making sure that they are on the optimum medication the right category of patients who need to be offered what is called an implantable cardioid defibrillator which is the gold standard in preventing ventricular arrhythmia or managing ventricular arrhythmia and other option of managing the underlying cause like correcting coronary artery disease by a uh, by revascularization or managing any underlying underlying arrhythmia mechanisms by radiofrequency ablation or implantation of pacing devices so how do we evaluate these people uh, individuals or their families there, there need to be a set protocol which need to start with a solid history taking a solid history and examination followed by methodical examination of basic investigations including ecg to echocardiogram and further evaluation ideally we should have the genetic testing however in the sri lankan setup we are not there yet on a routine scale we need to be uh, we need to be introducing this in sri lanka so ecg is not a very specific tool in exactly identifying the primary arrhythmia in some of the cases at least but it can give useful clues always and echocardiogram as we study uh, we discuss as well as electrophysiology studies and various other techniques are generally used to different degrees one challenging scenario is how to reassure school children in participating in sports or how to prevent them participating in uh, sports both are very challenging and very hard breaking uh, in the sense that we don't want to deny someone of uh, uh, opportunity to be involved in sports activities however it Uh, sometimes it's difficult not to do so because some people actually have ongoing risk of developing a cardiac uh, arrhythmia or cardiac arrest so there are various guidelines internationally following conditions generally are uh, prohibited from participating in uh, competitive sports at least or professional level sports like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy coronary artery congenital coronary artery abnormalities cardiomyopathies structural cardiac disease like significant mitral valve collapse which present with ventricular arrhythmias uh, 
and other genetic uh, arrhythmia syndromes. In summary, prevention is possible. However, it needs a methodical approach and treatment of sun cardiac arrest is primary focus should be on effective CPR with a chain of survival, uh, access to chain of survival. Thank you.